Welcome to the Creative Academy, your go-to source for coaching, accountability, and community for writers. I'm Donna Barker, and today it's my great pleasure to be speaking to Ken Johns, who is the author of Split Second Time Travel Stories, the, the series of those stories. So far, the author of one book, which is Lost in Time. And uh, that's what we're going to be talking to Ken about today, which is a uh, writing series um, and sequels, I guess. Uh, so Ken, do you want to take a second, just let us know who you are? Um, the thing that, so I'm going to say, the thing that really intrigues me, when I read your bio, and I'll put a link to the, uh, the celebrating that we did for you in our blog, because your bio there cracked me up and it just made me think, oh, I bet you were a guy who would have liked to have been able to travel back in time well, to, to be able to see how many different career paths you considered before you went <laughs> the one that you, you ultimately pursued. I did have a lot of uh, career paths. Like it, I don't know if I mentioned that in the bio, but it took me seven years to get a bachelor's degree. I guess I kept changing my mind. You, you did. You were a musician and then a philosopher and a psychologist. And then you, in all of that, you managed to create a film uh, portfolio. <laughs> Yeah, finally got around to nailing it down with something I liked, so. That's great. You know, it's funny, I, I say to my son, who's 22, uh, he's been uh, in university for many years, and yet he's just starting his second year because he's failed courses and just stopped going, and so failed courses. And my approach has always been, you know, every time you pursue a path and you find it's not a path that you love, that's good information because you're not going to end up being an employee of the federal government and miserable for the rest of your life you know, because you did the wrong degree. <laughs> so anyway, so that, that path led you to working in the film industry. Yeah, I, um, I got a job uh, in Vancouver, a little place called Gastown Post and Transfer in the late 80s. And uh, they were purchased by a, a group of guys and changed the name to Rainmaker. And then Rainmaker profited and grew. And then it was purchased by Deluxe, um, the worldwide name that everyone recognizes. And uh, so over the course of 25 years, I uh, sort of climbed the ladder, had a full career, raised the kids, they left the house. And uh, then I quit and decided that I needed to uh, chase my own dreams. So this is, this is your retirement career? It is. That's I wish I'd planned for it, but... Uh, <laughs> That's fabulous. All right, well, so I want to get right to it. So Lost in Time, I, actually tell me, like the, the blurb that you've written, I mean, the, just the tiny little 50 word um, story outline of the story is so intriguing. Do you want to just share that with us? And then we'll have some context for the rest of the, the conversation. Sure. Um, let me just grab a copy of it because I don't have it memorized. Okay. So it says, one family's tourist experience is about to get a whole lot more authentic. For their parents' silver wedding anniversary, Mia and her sister treat them to the ultimate getaway, a family vacation to the 14th century England, courtesy of the Split Second Time Travel Company. When the McLeods arrive, their medieval tour guide is nowhere in sight, and they find themselves on the run from a band of angry knights. When they injure her father and capture her sister, it's up to Mia to save her family, rescue the tour guide, and get the hell out of the Middle Ages. Love it. It sounds so much fun. Like so much fun. Okay, so you did, when you wrote that original book, did you know that it was going to be part of a series? Uh, not really, because it, it came out of a, a screenplay that I wrote like 20 years ago. Oh. It's an adaptation of that story. And that story has grown with me as my children grew. When I first wrote it, they were like early teens. And then when I rewrote it, uh, they were adults. So um, it's loosely based on, you know, the family model that I have, which is a uh, husband, wife, and two daughters. Yeah. Um, the, all the occupations or names are changed to protect the innocent. But uh, <laughs> it, it evolved with me over time. But when I finished um, the book and, and, and realized how it was going to end, the second book was suggested, like it, it suggested itself, it came to me and I thought, oh, that's, that's how the next book has to go. And so... While I wasn't planning a sequel, um, it needed it. It, was, it. it became obvious. Right, right. You know, when I wrote, I've only written one novel that is to completion and published. And I wrote that and the same thing happened for me, which was, well, 
you know what? I'm actually not sure if, uh, if, if the, how that worked in the, whether it was a cop-out ending, honestly, because I, the way it ends, it, it suggests that there is more to come with these characters and I love these characters. And yet I've spent the last three years and made so many failed starts at the next book. So I'm curious, and which, which that's what's, what's making me pause and wonder, well, was there ever really another story to follow or was it just that I couldn't figure out how to end it and that kind of cliffhanger about what comes next might be, might have been the easy way out. So are you finding that writing the second story is easier or harder or, or the same as, as having written the first one? Uh, it's easier and harder, like for different reasons. Um, book two feels harder because it's, it has more original content. Like I said, the first book was an adaptation of something you'd already written. Um, and um, book one, um, sorry, book two is, uh, is easier because the settings and characters are all already set up in book one. Um, but again, but again, it's harder because I'm trying to finish it in less time than I took to write the first book. Uh, because, less than a decade. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good goal. Well, actually, how long did, so you had, you've had that, did, so did the, did the screenplay ever get made into a film? No, it's an unpublished, unmade screenplay. It sat in a drawer for 10 years after I finished it. Did you pitch it? No. Oh, okay. So I just wrote it, and then it uh, as a learning experience. Yeah. We took uh, some screenwriting in, in university and, and just sort of did it on the side, a guy that I worked with. Yeah. And so how long did it take you then? Like, what, what do you, what, how long have you been working on book two? And what feels like a long time to you for writing a book? Well, I, I drafted book two in NaNoWriMo in uh, 2016. Okay. And so it's coming up on two years. Right. I'm, I'm trying to get it out. Uh, I've got a, an ARC reader booked for the end of January. Oh, wow. So very soon. That's fabulous. Yeah. Um, so with, did, did, speaking of readers, did reader feedback on book one play a role at all in how you've been writing book two? A little bit. Um, of course, family and friends are always very supportive and that's to be expected. Um, but as far as strangers reading it, I, uh, I don't have that much feedback. I have 10 reviews on Amazon, uh, nine on the American site, one on the Canadian site, and so far I'm averaging four stars out of five. So it seems like strangers are liking it, at least the ones who are reviewing it are liking it. Yeah. Uh, the sales aren't terrific, but I haven't pushed a lot of money at advertising. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they like it uh, leads me to think that I'm on the right path. Right, so in, you, you'd said you, at a certain point in writing book one, you, you knew that book two was going to be there. So what, what were the tips or what were the keys, the clues to you that told you there's another story that follows after this one? Well, the ending I chose um, splits the family and leaves some of them in the past. Oh, okay. So they obviously somebody has to go find them. Yeah. And are they, the, are they going to, are they still back in the medieval times then? Yeah. 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 Oh. So yeah. book, book two takes place in the, the same setting? Almost uh, immediately after it ends, like uh, book one ends mm -hmm. and book two starts uh, seconds later. <laughs> of course, split second later. <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what is book two called actually? I think well, the working title for book two is Back in Time. So Okay. Just so um, that it's like a series of uh, titles that match. So do you think that there's going to be a book three or book four? What are you thinking? Yeah, no, as I've written book two, book three suggested itself to me. So book three, uh, I've outlined book three. Wow. Okay. This, I mean, it sounds, the way you're talking, I don't know, it's just your energy and your, maybe your t-shirt with the VW van on it. It all sounds so easy. <laughs> Is it so easy? It's not, no. <laughs> I, uh, I struggle to plant my ass in the seat and actually write because, uh, you know, I have all the self-doubt that everybody has and, uh, you know, it's... It's the deadline that's making me work harder than I. <laughs> and is it a self-imposed deadline that you have? Yeah, because I booked, well, I only paid 20 bucks to book that arc reader, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's worth something. It is money spent. Uh, you know, those, those, well, so many people, we have self-imposed deadline. My, my self-imposed deadline for my novel was my 50th birthday. I thought I have had this goal on my list for 10 years. Since I turned 40, I've wanted to write and publish a novel. I couldn't hit 50 without having done that. So another, 
those self-imposed deadlines can be very, very motivating. Um, so do you, do you have a series Bible? Not yet. I, I have a, a style sheet that I got from the editor on book one. And so it's, it, it just has the grammar things that I'm keeping consistent and then the spellings and the made up words. Um, but uh, I haven't generated a series Bible yet. I think it's probably time, but I just haven't gotten around to it. Right. It's, uh, so or is it basically you've got your four main characters being the family and then are the other characters are easy enough to keep track of. Is that why you're not needing it yet? Yeah, there's about a dozen characters and uh, half of them are from the present and half of them are in the past. And where are the ones that are in the present? What, so present being 2018 in, yeah. in Vancouver, in Canada? Well, I, I have them as a Canadian family. I haven't, uh, I, I don't think I specifically said where they're from. Right. Um, you know, one of them works for the RCMP. I, I've used little Canadianisms. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they go to New York to actually time travel. The company is, is based in New York, but it's like a vacation, right? So. Yeah. So are, is, have you thought about the, um, the marketing potential and the business side of having written series, in, written in a series? I think people like um, series. If they enjoy the first book, they, um, they know they've had a good experience with those characters and they can trust that author. Mm -hmm. And so as long as book one um, delivers, people will, I think they'll buy book two. And this is, I'm speaking as a reader, not from any experience I've had. Right. But I, I buy book two in a series if I liked book one, and I think that's kind of universal. Because yeah. you expect the same experience. And as long as you continue to deliver that experience, one would expect people to continue to buy. Right. And I guess with your story, your characters be, are, are not aging, so they will remain the same characters. Are they going to be going to be the same age in book three as well? Or is there going to be a coming back to the main, like to the, will there be a progression of time in real time? There, there will be a progression of time in book three. One of the characters is going to age because it gets stuck somewhere for a while before they find him. But uh, it's, uh, other than that, it's like in the present, you're always the same because you come back to when you left. Okay. I, uh, I'm just, for whatever reason, I thought of, man, I hope that that travel company has got a good insurance policy because that just sounds like a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> travel company. They don't go out of business, I guess. <laughs> well, that's part of the, uh, that's part of the secret. Uh, in book two, we revealed that the travel company is in fact uh, antagonistic. Oh, it's like, um, what is that series? Um, oh, I think it's on Netflix. Uh, where people pay to go and have an experience where it's they're with robots who cannot kill people and they can do horrifying things. What is that? That's name? Westworld. Westworld. Yes, Westworld. Um, yeah, anyway, it just makes me think of that with the idea of the antagonistic uh, company. How do you keep the story fresh and twisty? That's one of uh, Eileen's words, I think, when readers already know so much about the characters. I'm a plot guy, right? And, uh, and so I try to um, constantly watch to make sure I've got conflict in the dialogue, conflict physically from the environment and from the antagonists. And that's why it takes me so long to, to finish is because I, I'm constantly rereading and going, where's the conflict? Mm. Um, and, uh, and sometimes that, if, there, if I throw in some conflict and it leads them to some place I didn't plot, yeah. then I have to change my plot because it's more, um, uh, you know, what's the word? What's the word? Um, I can't remember the word. You know, where it evolves naturally yeah. from, from what's happening. Yeah. If I try to force it, um, then it just, it, it feels fake, right? Right. So, so you have, you have book, you had book two all plotted out. Book three is plotted with the caveat that if the story changes it, it changes. Yeah, you know, uh, I'll say, you know, this happens and then this happens because of that and then that happens because of this and these guys are, are chasing him, but yet they don't find him for like four chapters. And so it just gives me that kind of uh, leeway. Mm -hmm. right? So I know who's chasing who. It's, I, I, I draw a linear um, map of, of my world and say, okay, these people are here right now and they're back there. And, and so I, I know what's going to come next. And I, I sort of write like, um, like, like TV, I, I cut... Um, on a, on a cliffhanger and right. go, go visit someone else before I pay something else off. And uh, hopefully that's twisty enough. Yeah. 
<laughs> what, um, a couple of people in the Creative Academy have got some experience with script writing or done script writing courses. Do you find that having that experience and having worked in post-production has helped you as, a, as an author with your storytelling? Well, certainly my love of cinema, um, I find myself, I call myself like a, I'm a movie geek, trivia geek. I, uh, I always have enjoyed movies and books, but uh, the, uh, the, com the combination of spending my, you know, every waking moment in fictional worlds uh, has allowed me to, um, I think, uh, get a feel for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend people who are interested in improving their craft look at screenwriting or read screenwriting books, or do you think it's too different of, uh, of a storytelling? Like, maybe more specifically, my question is, what specific value does understanding cinematic storytelling bring to writing a novel, in your opinion? Every experience. In, in my opinion, I think that um, because I like to write action and uh, I think um, definitely well-written uh, movies or, and TV shows keep it moving. There's never any, um, at least the ones I like, there's never any um, wasted time, wasted dialogue, mm -hmm. wasted description. Of course, with pictures, you don't need description. That's the, the big difference is that you have to describe what the camera's filming. Mm -hmm. and, that's actually my weak point, I think. I, I, I under-describe. Um, my, my dialogue seems to be all right. My action seems to be all right. But as far as describing the scenes, that's where I fall short because it's not my forte. And so do you go back and, and work on that in your second and third drafts or? Yeah, adding a bit of description here and there, trying to bring in the senses. I, uh, I read a lot of how-to books, uh, how to write um, novel books before I took Eileen's course at SFU. Um, and that was uh, the reason I eventually went to the course was because I got all I could from books mm -hmm. and I needed real feedback. You mentioned earlier that you work with an editor. So do you work with an editor at the developmental stage or is it more just for the, the fine editor to copy edit? I did both um, on the first book. There was a developmental edit about a year before the, the line edit. And what, what is your plan for book two? I don't think I have time for a developmental edit if I'm going to make that deadline. But, it, uh, you know, as I say, it's only a $20 investment. <laughs> well, and maybe, maybe your ARC readers will know. Uh, we'll give you the feedback that you need. Uh, maybe. Do you, but do you feel more confident then also having had that first one developmentally edited? Yeah, they, uh, they, they, um, the main criticism was about tone. They seem to, because I have, I have comedy and I have like death described graphically. So the, the developmental editor was a little bit confused. He thought, you know, the characters are a little bit flippant and they don't seem to be grieving with the loss of this character kind of thing. Oh. And so that, that was an interesting point because, you know, uh, characters are always flippant in the movies because the dialogue is like banter. And, and I think that's maybe a, a crutch or a, or a hangover that I have from that world that I have to sort of um, work on. So that was good to bring that to my attention. That is interesting. And in, in my first thought is, oh, you must be a Quebecer because Quebecers are very <laughs> flippant and dark. And I, my experience growing up in Quebec, it seems to be the humor is different than other places in Canada. Ah, You're see. not a Quebecer. No, I was born and raised in Victoria. Huh. Uh, went to school in Toronto and only made it back as far as Vancouver. <laughs> well, it's good that you made it back. Good. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how, how are you handling the juggling, the author side and the marketing side? So you've got one book that's out there, people reading it, although not reviewing it a lot, but um, how are you managing that? I've kind of um, set the, the publishing aside and, and focused on the, on the writing of book two. Um, I mean, I am having a sale next weekend on Amazon. It's gonna be free while I'm at the conference. But other than that, I haven't done anything for like six weeks um, because I, I need to get more content. Uh, like um, Common Belief has it that uh, book one's not going to sell that much as an indie author and people aren't going to really discover you until you've got two or three books under your belt. So content is job one. I, I'm working on creating more, com yeah. more content. Right. And so once, that, once book two is out, is the idea then to make book one perma-free or just have it rolling free often? 
I think I think I'll, I'll probably go the periphery route. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I look forward to talking to you in uh, in a f whatever. Let's say if you're beta reading, I guess it'll be in 2020 when you'll be able to give us some analysis on how that <laughs> strategy has worked. And by then you'll have book three out, I'm imagining. Any advice that you have for folks who are thinking, this is a great idea, but I don't know how to pursue it. Or alternately, that sounds absolutely terrifying. I don't think I can do it. What would you say? It seems to me like when I started this, I was thinking, oh, I'm going to write this book based on something I've already written. And then I got into it and I enjoyed it. And I thought, oh, okay, I'll write another one. And it's sort of snowballing. And, and uh, while I'm, I'm not retired, I actually have a day job. I drive a courier truck now. Uh, I'd like to actually retire and, and just write. And uh, that's the goal. But I haven't, uh, I haven't really you know, had any uh, um, insight into uh, what's the scariest thing or, or what, uh, what- You're doing it because you love it is what I'm hearing. <laughs> you know, the hours are good. <laughs> Really? I was just communicating with somebody who's uh, an accountability client, and she said that since we've been working together, she's getting up at five o'clock in the morning because her muse is speaking to her, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> if that happened to me, I would fire the accountability coach because I don't want anything to get me up at five o'clock in the morning. Anyway, um, so wait, given that you do still have a full-time job, when are you writing? I'm writing uh, evenings and weekends. I guess like uh, like I have for the last five years. Right. Ah, all right. So you just got your schedule and it, and you stick to it. Fabulous. I try. <laughs> Ken, that was great. It's uh, speaking from my own experience. I admire the fact that you can take you can take those characters and move them through you know more experiences. It's something that I aspire to be able to do, and uh, I'm really looking forward to finding following the trajectory of the split second time travel stories and uh, book two and and checking in with you to see how book three is going once you've launched book two and uh, we'll see you in the creative academy and um, yeah thank you for taking time to share with us folks if you want to check in with Ken every now and then you can uh, you can catch him in the glip community and he might be there to answer your specific questions about writing series and if you're not in the creative creative academy uh better join because you get access to this guy and about 50 other fabulous authors all right thanks a lot ken thank you are you a member of the creative academy yet join us today and unlock a wealth of resources master classes feedback opportunities and community events designed to help you reach the next step in your writing journey no matter what stage you're at, we've got a helping hand to guide you along the way. Check out our free resource room if you'd like to get a taste of how we can help you reach your writing and publishing goals. Thank you for bringing us along on your writing and publishing journey. Crystal, Eileen, and I hope to see you around the Creative Academy soon.